Welcome, shalom, good evening, welcome to our new weekly Soul of the Parsha class. We are now in Parashat Bo, the third Parsha of the book of Exodus, the second book in the Torah. And our topic for today is confronting your fears, and especially confronting what you fear most, facing what you fear most. There are some things that we feel are too big for us to handle. We can't face them. They're too big, too great, and we are too small. <clears throat> we can't face them. And this is exactly what Moshe, Moses, is going through in this parsha. He fears Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the summit, the pinnacle of his fears. And although he has been facing it for some time now, this is what, what is called the final showdown in many ways, is in this parsha. Um, so let's just uh, place ourselves in context. Um, these two parts that we're now reading, Va'era last week, and this now Bo, uh, cover the ten plagues. But they cover the ten plagues in a way that they're divided into the first seven plagues and the final three plagues. The first seven plagues were recounted in the previous parsha in Va'era, and now we're arriving at the final three plagues. That's how it is. And because this year we're focusing on the first segment of each parsha, so the first segment of Bo, the parsha we're in right now, is doesn't have any plague uh, in it. It's just a preparation for the uh, for the eighth one, right? It's eight, nine, and ten. These are the plagues that are going to be uh, that are going to take place in this parsha, and here we're just in the middle, hanging between the first seven that were in the previous parsha and the final three that are in this parsha. We're just in this transition, which is a very meaningful transition. These numbers from seven to three, and everything that this stands for. Now the parsha is called Bo. Bo means in Hebrew, come. Who is coming to whom? This is God telling Moses, come to Pharaoh. And this is the opening verse, and God spoke to Moses and said, Come to Pharaoh. And the soul parsha is named after this coming. And uh, now we would think this is a unique expression, having the parsha named after this expression, and appearing very dramatically at the opening of this parsha. Uh, however, it turns out that this exact same phrase and God said to Moshe, come to Pharaoh, has already appeared twice uh, in the previous parsha. This is the third time that the exact same term, and God said to Moses, come to Pharaoh, uh, has appeared. So it, it's only now, for some mysterious reason, it's only now that it's a, it opens the parsha, and the parsha is actually called after the, the verb, the injunction, Bo, come. So, uh, why is this? What exactly is going on? And where exactly were the other two times? So if you go back to the previous parsha and you check, you see that it, it goes like this. The first time we had this expression, come to Pharaoh, was just between the second, the sorry, the first and the second plagues, between the plague of blood, the river, the Nile River turning into blood, and the plague of the frogs. So be, just before the second plague, there was this expression, come to Pharaoh. Then we had, you go, you jump three plagues later, and just before the fifth plague, the plague of pestilence, again we have this expression, come to Pharaoh, bo el pao. And then again we jump three more plagues, and we arrive at this parsha, and then just before the eighth plague, again, the third time, Come to Pharaoh, Bo el Paro. So it's between the, it's just before the second plague, the fifth plague, and the eighth plague, with the first two being in the first parasha, and the final third one being in this parasha. So we need to make sense of this. But let's start with something very beautiful, very simple, very beautiful. The Hebrew word, which is the name of this parasha, Bo, is just a two letter word. And it's made up of the letter Bet, which is the second letter in the alphabet, <clears throat> and the letter Aleph, which is the first letter in the, in the alphabet. Very simple word. And 
So it's two and one, right? That's how the word is, is built. It's bet and aleph, which is numerically two and one. So just looking at this number, it reflects the appearances of the, of the expression come to Pharaoh, because we have three times it said, with the first two being in the previous parsha and the final third one being in this parsha. So there's something very beautiful that the, the word itself reflects how this expression appears twice in one parsha, the third in this parsha. Um, now, but it's even more beautiful than that. Everything in the Torah that comes with, with the number 10, there are several groups of 10 in the Torah, like the Ten Commandments, which we'll talk about later on. And there's also the 10 plagues. And there are more tens. Every time we have the number 10, according to Kabbalah, it corresponds to the 10 sefirot, the 10 divine emanations, with which Hashem, God, is, has created the world and is continue, continuously recreating the world and channels divine energy, divine light, divine light into the world. Um, now, that, so the 10 plagues are another example of this. How does one make the correspondence between the ten plagues and the, the ten sefirot, the ten divine emanations? It could go from the top down, from the bottom up, and there are, some, and there are also some other systems. But the main system, which the Arizal, the greatest Kabbalist, Rabbi Isaac Luria, 16th century Kabbalist who lived in, who d- spent the last years of his life and died and is buried in Tzfat in Israel, he said, he, he's the, the most important Kabbalist, and he said that the ten plagues correspond to the ten, to the ten sefirot if you count them, if you, if you go over the sefirot from the bottom up. So you start with the final sefirah, which is Malchut, and you end with the first sefirah, which is Keter. And this goes beautifully with the fact that the plagues are divided into seven in the previous parasha and three in this parasha. Why? Because the ten sefirot are divided into the upper three sefirot, which correspond to the intellectual faculties of the, of the soul, and the lower seven sefirot, which correspond to the emotive faculties, the emotions and, the, and modes of behavior that are in our, in our psyches. So if the plagues are counted from the bottom up, it's a bottom up process, so it makes beautiful sense, perfect sense, that the first seven which correspond to the emotive powers, would be in one parsha, and then the final three in, in, in another parsha. Now, let's, uh, I'm going to um, show, share with you the following diagram. In this diagram, you can see the correspondence between the plagues and the sefirot, and how they play out in these two parashot. So, let's count them from the bottom up, and, of course, uh, we're going, we're going in the reverse direction of the Hebrew. The sefirot go from right to left, so we're going from left to right. Actually, it does. It's more natural for an English speaker. If this were in Hebrew, it would be counterintuitive. So, going from the bottom up, it's blood, and then we go up to frogs, and then lice, and then the wild animals, and then we go up to pestilence, and then boils, and then hail. That was the seven plagues that we read about in the previous parsha, and then finally we go up to locusts and darkness and the plague of the firstborn in this parsha. Right? Lower seven, the, that have to that correspond to the body and to the emotional faculties of the, the, the faculties of the heart, the attributes of the heart, and the upper three which correspond to the head or to the intellectual faculties. Now, remember, the three appearances of the, of the expression come to Pharaoh appeared just before the second, the fifth, and the eighth plague. What does this tell us? So look at the screen. They come precisely just before the three triplets, the three triangles. We had a class a few weeks ago, and we spoke about this structure of the triangle of this dynamic of, of right, left, and center, or thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, as being the foundation of Judaism, and the, and the real, the deep reason 
why Judaism is formulated uh, over three generations of Abraham, Jacob, and, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, uh, and, and we spoke, we introduced this whole topic, which many people know, of course, but we spoke about this main topic of this dynamic, of the triangle. Here we're going from the bottom up, not the top down, but we see something very beautiful. We see that the first plague is, is one thing, and then come the, fi the, the, the following. Nine plagues are divided beautifully, according to this map of the Sefirot, they're divided into three triplets, and just before each one of them, God needs to tell Moses, come to Pharaoh, come to Pharaoh, and then finally one third and final time in this parasha, come to Pharaoh. So why is this? Why, how does this make sense? The, the reason is really very simple. Malchut is the whole idea of the first plague being blood and striking the Nile River is because the Egyptians worshipped the Nile River. The Nile River was their source of life, of livelihood, and everything came from below. They weren't dependent on rain, they were dependent on, on the river having water, the river flowing. And all their water for uh, irrigation and for drinking came from the river. So w w by, by striking the river, it was like before advancing to, to you know, strike down or bring down the kingdom of Egypt as a, as a kingdom, you need to touch the core of their kingdom, and the core of their kingdom is what they define as their king, and they saw the Nile River in a way as their king. So first you have to take care of their religious deity, you have to put it aside, push it down, and, this, and really demonstrate to them that the, there is one king to the world, and it's not the Nile River, there is the true king is the one who can turn this river into blood. So the first plague was just an introduction. It was just getting getting warmed up and, and getting really getting rid of the deity of what they saw as their so to speak king and showing them that there's only one true king who governs everything in reality. So that was one thing. And then the the next nine plagues are really going deeper and deeper, higher and higher into the soul or into the essence of what Egypt is all about and peeling it off, peeling it away, taking it down. And in our own hearts, this is like a process of gradual ascent towards the highest point within us as it's covered up by the external shells or husks of Mitzrayim, that we need to peel them away, take them away. And we're going upwards and upwards into the essence of faith, of connection with God. And it's built into these three, uh, three groups. Now, this still doesn't explain what makes the third one more special than the other, than the, the first two. So here we can really sh sh point out uh, three things, or actually four things, uh, that demonstrate that the third one is far more important than the first two. So, uh, the first thing is very simple. It has, well, the, well, the first thing is, we actually said it, the first thing is the most simple, is we see that the way the portions are divided, the first two don't get a portion named after them, and they're, they're buried somewhere in the previous portion. We didn't really notice them as something, you know, so special. And the third one gets to open a parsha and gets a parsha to be named after it. So that's the first thing. Second thing is that the lower seven sefirot correspond to the body, and the, and the higher three sefirot correspond to the head. And of course, the head is more important than the, than the body. The head is more central. The head is where your personality is, where your character is, where your brain is, where your mentality is where everything that you, the, and, 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 and you know, the simplest thing is that the head leads the body. The, the body doesn't lead the head. It's the head that leads the body. A third beautiful thing is that, uh, if I said before, the word Bo is made up of the two letters, Bet and Aleph, which uh, numerically is two and one. 
However, if you look at the first two, they come before, right? Look at the, the, the lowest one. It comes before the lowest triplet. But it goes that first there's one plague, frogs, and then there's a pair, lice and wild animals. And same goes for the second come to Pharaoh. First there's one plague, pestilence. Right? If you if you follow this map, the map of the Sephirot, first there's one pest there's one plague, the plague of pestilence, and then there's a pair. So the order is one, two, one, two. That's the opposite of the structure of the word bo, right? Bo bet aleph is two and then one. So it doesn't really match perfectly. It's a boy is three, but it, it, it's not like it, it, it reflects the word. However, once you get to this parsha and you have the word bo come to Pharaoh, it reflects perfectly because now in the upper third, in the upper triplet, it's a, it's an up, it's a upward pointing triangle. And you have first a pair of plagues and then a third you know, climactic one. And so you have first two and then one. And that is how the word bo is structured. You have first two and then uh, and then one. So now we have these three um, uh, characteristics. And the final characteristic uh, is that um, in the first two instances, God says, Come to Pharaoh and speak to him, or come to Pharaoh and say to him. However, the third and final one in this parsha is just come to Pharaoh. It's not coming for a certain specific purpose of telling him a certain specific thing. It's just coming to Pharaoh as a general abstract movement of coming. So it's almost like it's for it's in the first two instances it was uh, coming for a certain purpose, and in the third instance the coming is the purpose. It's not a means to an end. It's in some mysterious way, it's the end itself. The purpose is coming into Pharaoh. Okay, so we have four things here that separate very very clearly the third bow from the first two. It, it has its own parsha, it opens its own parsha, and the parsha is named after it. It corresponds to the head. It, it, it reflects the, the sephirotic structure of first, first a pair of plagues and then a third one, as opposed to the first two. And it's not a means to an end, it's somehow the end in itself. The purpose of coming is to come to Pharaoh. It's not coming for the sake of telling him or speaking something to him. So now we have to we have to figure this out. What does all this mean? So there are there are two more secrets. Everything in this class today, this evening, is about the transition from two to one and from bet to aleph. So there are two more beautiful things secrets, ideas, that have to do with this transition. And when you put them all together, you get the, we get to really the crux of the, of the story here, which is, like I said before, confronting one's fears. But before we get to that, let's look at, at the, at, so again, two mysteries or two ideas, and that have to do with this movement from two to one, and when we wrap it all up, we'll get it. So the first thing is, I said before, there are several groups of ten. To be precise, there are three major groups of ten in the Torah. The first most, the first important group of ten is the ten utterances with which God created the world. The world is created in ten utterances. The sages go over them, and they, they do something interesting. They say that you can clearly see nine of them, and then they say... Well, the first verse, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, that's also a saying. It's a saying without the word God said, but it's a saying. So you have ten utterances that make the world. The second important uh, group of ten is ahead of us. It's not before us. 
it's, it's, we didn't pass it, we're going in the direction, is the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments and the Ten Utterances are really, they really go together. And according to the Zohar, they absolutely correspond, because the first ten, the Ten Utterances, create a world, but the world is devoid of meaning and purpose in and of itself. It's just the world, you can get lost in the world. You can, you can live your life in the world and it doesn't make any sense. The Ten Commandments imbue the world with meaning and purpose and, and they tell us what God wants us to do with the world. In a way we can say that the first uh, ten utterances, they just describe what is. But the Ten Commandments describe what ought to be. Right? And the transition between what is and what ought to be, that's, that completes the world. If you just have a world and it's devoid of meaning or purpose, then it's created for no reason. So the, the true reason the world is created is that the world is waiting and waiting for 26 generations, from the creation of Adam and Eve to the uh, receiving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, it waits for the Torah to be revealed and to imbue the world with purpose and meaning, not just to tell us what is, but what ought to be and how things should um, should uh, move from just being to turning the world into what it should be. Now, how does the ten utterances? How do the ten utterances begin? What letter do they open with? If we said that the first utterances is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, so it would be in Hebrew Bereshit bara Elokim et Hashem Avetar. It's Bereshit starts with B, that is Bet. How do the Ten Commandments begin? They begin with I am Hashem, your God, who brought you out of Egypt. In Hebrew, it's Anochi Hashem Elokecha. Starts with the letter Aleph. The creation of the world starts with Bet. The giving of the Torah starts with Aleph. So, um, the transition between the world, what is, and the Torah, what ought to be, is a transition between from two to one. Together it's like the word Bo. Right? It's also a movement from plurality to unity. Two stands for duality, or in, in general, if you broaden the concept, it's, it's, it's a plurality in general. And then it, you move from that to unity. God's unity is revealed and the Torah is given to us. However, in order for the Ten Commandments to be revealed, we need to have, in between them, we need to have the Ten Plagues. Why do we need the Ten Plagues? Because the idea is that the, word, the, the world itself is revealed. Everyone can see the world, you can see nature, and enjoy the Ten Utterances. But to hear the Ten Commandments, Aseret Adibod, it's a different speech, it's a deeper, higher speech, you need to break a certain external shell that covers your ears and covers the world and covers God's words. And this is the shell of Egypt, of Mitzrayim. And the whole descent into Egypt is really symbolic of uh, the soul descending into the world, and then in order to hear God's, not just His utterances, that these are revealed, but to hear His, his commandments, what He wants of us, what He expects of us, what really, how He touches our souls and tells us what He wants us to be, is, um, it's covered, it's hidden. And because we're covered, we're hidden in the, in the shells of Egypt. So the idea is that the, the Ten Commandments, it's like this thing that is on the inside, it's what we call is Israel, and on the outside is what we call Egypt. And the Egypt needs to be broken, and the Israel, the inner dimension, needs to be revealed, and then the commandments can be heard. So going into Egypt is falling into the depth of the material world, and then the plagues is breaking and breaking and breaking the external shell so that the, the hidden words of God are revealed. So the movement between the ten utterances, which start with bet, and that this is the duality and plurality of the world, the world of the many, the reality of the many, many different things in the world. 
the transition from that to the world of unity, to hearing the, the one God's will of what He wants us to do with this world, which is in the Ten Commandments, is we have to go through the word Bo. Bo is the transition between Bet and Aleph. And we need to, to go through these ten plagues of breaking and breaking and breaking. And the deeper we go, the higher we go, the more we break until we get to the essence of our own souls, which is resides in the highest sefirah. If you look at the utterances and the commandments, the highest sefirah would be the first utterance and the first commandment. First utterance is in the beginning. First commandment is, I am the Lord your God that brought you out of Egypt, which is really the command to believe in God. However, in the plagues, it's the final plague, not the first plague, because the plagues go from the bottom up. So to get to the to reveal the highest essence, we need to go all the way to the final uh, commandment. In a way, if we sh- uh, when you when you saw the correspondence to the Sefirot, then you saw that the final bow, the third bow, corresponds to the upper three Sefirot, but especially to the last one to the firstborn, the final plague. Why? Because same idea. We have first two and then one. We had two instances of Bo and then a third one. So within that third one, the first two plagues are not the main thing. It's Bet leading to Aleph. So the Aleph is the final tenth plague. That's like breaking the final shell in order to reveal the first commandment which redeems or brings, you know, raises up and brings meaning and purpose to the first utterance. The first utterance is in many ways the the most important utterance. Everything was created in the first utterances, according to most interpreters. And also, all the commandments are included in the first commandment. So the final plague is the most important one. The final plague is the plague that releases the first commandment, the command to believe in God, to have this connection to God, and that redeems and raises up the entire world, the entire creation. So that's the first thing we see, is that the this whole sim- symbolic word of Bo, Bet Aleph, not just reveals the inner structure of the entire map of the Ten Plagues, it also is the key to understanding a bigger map the transition from the first ten utterances to the ten commandments that has to go through the ten plagues. So, in in terms of now speaking of Moses and Moses coming to Pharaoh, Moses is now coming into the final three sefirot. But really, really more than anything, that's, uh, it's the head. It's the it's the head of state. It's the head of Egypt, the king of Egypt. But more than anything, it's the the final plague because that's the crown. That's where the king. The power of the king, the king of Egypt, resides. The first of is called Ketel, crown. And this is where what he has to confront now. He has to he's, he went through all the Sephirot, and now he has to meet the the uh to confront the Ketel, the crown, the pinnacle of all the Sephirot, which is all of Egypt, which is also something within himself. Now we're moving to the the final and third concept of what this transition between uh, from 2 to 1 from Bet to Aleph really stands for. There's a very basic famous question that uh, that has to do with this expression come to Pharaoh. And the Zohar asks this question. The question is why does it say come to Pharaoh and not go to Pharaoh? It should have said in all three instances, but especially the third one because that's the most important one It should say, go to Pharaoh. Come is come to me. And go is go to someone else. And God is speaking to Moses, and he should say, go to Pharaoh, not come to Pharaoh. So the Zohar comes with this explanation. The Zohar says, Moshe is afraid. He is terrified. He doesn't dare approach Pharaoh himself. The idea, here, the idea here is that the ten sefirot, the ten emanations, they exist in the, in, they have a positive, holy version, and they have a negative, unholy 
version. There's the version of the Kedusha holiness, and the version of Klipa, which is the version of the external shells. And Pharaoh is the crown of the shells. He's the Keter de Klipa. He is the pinnacle of the impure, unholy structure of the Ten Commandments. And he's called the prophet Ezekiel, describes him as this giant serpent who dwells within his river, and who says, the river is mine, and I have created myself. He purports, he pretends to be the king of the world. We spoke about the Nile River being the king in some way, but that was just on the outside. On the inside, the deep, the deep religion of Egypt, we can say, is Pharaoh being the king. Pharaoh is the true king here. And why? Because he says, I created myself. He is the giant serpent that, so to speak, pretends to be creating itself, right? In the Greeks called it the Euroboros. We call it the circular circle, Nachasha Kalaton. And he he and this is something that is extremely powerful, pretentious. It could be pathetic, but it isn't pathetic in this case. There's some power to this claim, and there's some madness to Pharaoh, which Moses feels is beyond his scope to face. So the Kabbalistic explanation, and this is where we get to how this connects to Bo and Bet Aleph two one, is that Pharaoh is the crown of the impure realm. Moses belongs to the holy realm, to the pure and good and positive and holy realm. But he doesn't come from the crown. He comes from the second sefirah. He comes from the sefirah of chokhmah, wisdom. Right? The first sefirah is called keter, which means crown. Second sefirah is called chokhmah, which means wisdom. Then there's understanding and knowledge and loving kindness and the rest. But the first two are crown and wisdom. Pharaoh is rooted in the first sefirah, which is the sefirah of crown, the impure, unholy version of it. But it's the highest sefirah. The highest power manifests itself in the negative realm as the most powerful, lowest of, of you know, things. It, 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 there's a principle that the higher the, so the spiritual root, the lower it falls when it falls into this world. So the most despicable king is in some strange way rooted in the highest sefirah. Pharaoh is the most despicable, the, the most rude, the most cruel of kings but he's rooted in the highest sefirah. Moses is all, he's a righteous man, he's a good man, he comes from the realm of holiness. But he's not rooted in the highest sefirah, he's rooted in the second highest sefirah. So again we have the number two and the number one. Moses is number two in the holy world. Pharaoh is number one in the unholy world. Imagine someone who's on the path of tshuva, returning to God, repenting and rectifying his ways. It, previously, before he discovered God and the Torah and started doing tshuva, uh, he had a certain teacher or guide or mentor or guru or just, a, you know, or just some good friend who was a, a kind of guide or teacher for him. And then he realized, this person, that this is not a good teacher, this is not a good way. This teacher is very brilliant, he's very sharp, he's very bright, he's very talented, he's extremely knowledgeable, he maybe has some, even some powers maybe. But it all belongs to the unholy world. So he leaves him. And he joins, he starts, he's, he's going on the path of tshuva, and he starts joining the right path, and he finds good rabbis and good teachers and starts studying Torah and, and changes his entire life, that it goes in a, in a way that's, that's, that's connected to his soul, that's connected to God, that's doing God's will. What happens if he meets his old teacher? 
So he now knows that the old teacher, everything about him is wrong. His teachings are wrong, it's an unholy world, everything that he's teaching, it's all either very ego, or it's a big lie, or it has to do with a lot of pride, or it, it you know, whatever it is, it's not holy, it's not divine, it doesn't have to do with putting God in the center. Either this teacher or guru is the center, or he says there's no God and it's just some atheist or, or some, you know, abstract spirituality that is all about, you know, just leaving this world and not rectifying the world, not rectifying yourself truly. Whatever it is, he has distanced himself from this teacher. He now is connected to something far higher than the teacher. But it doesn't change the fact that the teacher is still brighter and smarter and more talented and more, you know, maybe has more confidence and, and has more authority and maybe is also older than him. It's very frightening to confront your old teacher, even though you're now connected to something that is far higher and better and bigger than all the teachings of the teacher. Because in some way, he is still a teacher, and you are still a student compared to him. So you could say that this old mentor figure for you, and I'm sure many of you, you know, know this experience. I'm sure many of you know this experience. That you have a certain person in your past who, was, who is an extremely impressive person, extremely wise or knowledgeable or you know, powerful or self-confident, but it's all in this world of chaos, this world of, of, of idolizing some, some wrong thing. Idolizing yourself or idolizing, you know, the, the apparent nonsensical nature of the world or, or just being this nihilist, whatever it is. And you're connected to something, you discover the Torah. But still in some way you feel that he is rooted in the sphere of Ketel, but you are rooted at the most in the sphere of wisdom. Right? He is connected to some crown, a negative crown, but the crown, by essence, is higher than what you're connected to, which at the most is the level of wisdom. You don't, you're not, a, you're not as powerful or smart or, 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 you know, confident as he is. So and it's very confusing, because you know that you're connected to something much higher, but who you are, you're not as high as he is. And you're not, you don't have this power that he has. And this is exactly what is going on with Moses now. Moses grew up with Pharaoh in the palace. Pharaoh is older. Pharaoh is more powerful. Pharaoh runs a, a whole kingdom. Pharaoh is experienced in being a king. Pharaoh has all the power in the world. So he's, a, he's the crown. But he's the crown of Egypt. Moses has pushed away all of that. He went to the desert. He became a shepherd. He discovered God in the desert. He became the messenger of God. He can speak to God. He's a prophet. He now knows that Egypt is one big lie. The palace is one big lie. It's all one big lie. But he doesn't have the crown yet. He, he's just, he's connected to the level of wisdom. He is number two of holiness. And Pharaoh is number one of unholiness. So again, it's those two numbers, those two letters, Bet Aleph. And so the coming here is the coming of one who is rooted in the second sphira to one who is rooted in the first sphira. So it's going higher and it's facing someone that maybe rationally you shouldn't, there's no reason to fear him but we're not rational beings. And irrationally, you feel you're terrified, you're petrified, you can't move, you can't face him. The first two times God said to Moses, come to Pharaoh, it wasn't a big deal. It was just coming and telling him something, coming and saying something. And it was still during the first plagues. It was just before the, the second plague and then before the fifth plague not before the final three, which correspond to the head. The head, that's Pharaoh himself, and especially the, the, the last one, the firstborn, the, the last plague, that's, that's really the essence of Pharaoh himself. 
So now he's terrified. So what does the Zohar say about this? The Zohar starts by asking, why does it say come instead of go? And then the Zohar tells us this entire explanation that he was afraid, that he was only able, Moses was only able to come to the lower 10 levels of Egypt, but not to the highest 10th level, or to the rivers of the serpent. The crown is like the serpent, and then the lower nine sefirot of unholiness, that's like the various rivers that come out of the serpent. But he was afraid to approach the serpent itself, because he was of the level of, like I said, wisdom. So the, the answer to why is the verb here, come instead of go, is that God is telling him, come to me and I will go with you to Pharaoh. That's the answer of the Zohar, for why the language here, the, the verb used, is come and not go. In a certain sense, this was already twice before in the previous parasha, but it didn't strike home. And we, you know, we don't really pay attention to those two. We pay attention to it now. Because now, and also Moses himself is paying attention now, and that's why he calls this parasha after this, this verb. God is telling him, you, I, I hear you, Moses. You can't go to Pharaoh. So don't go. Come to me, and I will go with you. The verse in Ezekiel that we spoke about, that likens Pharaoh to a serpent, says, I am, it's God telling the prophet to tell Pharaoh, I am upon you, Pharaoh, the great serpent who dwells in his rivers and so on. I, God, am upon you. So this is what God is telling Moses. I, you can't beat, you're right in being afraid. You can't beat Pharaoh on your own. You need me, so come to me and we'll go together and I will be upon Pharaoh, and I will help you vanquish him. You're not alone. I'm with you. Now, we said before that Pharaoh is like the, un, the impure uh, crown. We can also say, and that's an expression that's actually used, that the positive holy crown which is the superconscious of each and every one of us. It's the essence of our own souls. It's the deep mo the, 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 the deepest most deepest most no the deepest most powerful, most essential element of who we are. We can call this the holy pharaoh. And this is a Kabbalistic expression. Paro de Kdusha. The holy pharaoh. There's an unholy pharaoh, that's the pharaoh of the story. And there's a holy pharaoh, a very spiritual, very high, positive pharaoh within each one of us, including within Moses himself. Who is this holy pharaoh, this positive pharaoh? So the, the description in the Zohar, in another place in the Zohar, is that the, the name, the word paro, pharaoh, has to do with spreading and releasing and breaking free something. If something is parua, it means it, it jumps out and goes free and releases itself. It has to do with freedom and release and expansion and breaking forth. All of these words have to do with this verb, the Hebrew word para which is the root of Paro. So the Holy Pharaoh, according to the Zohar, is the place up in, within godliness, and it's reflected within each, each and every soul, is the place where all the lights originate from. And to be precise, the Zohar says that from this unique special place called the Holy Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of Holiness, come all the lights and all the sparks and everything that's hidden. That's the how the Zohar describes it. In, in, so I will just read it from the Zohar. The Zohar, it says, it says, uh, 
דהתפריעו והתגליין מיני כל נהורין וכל בוצינין, כל מדהב הסתים מטאמן. From this, the Zohar tells us about the expression, the home, the house of Pharaoh. It was, had to do with, uh, it's, it revolves around a story of Yosef in the, in the palace. It comes from Genesis, but it's very relevant for this parasha as well. It's the place where all the lights and the sparks and everything that's hidden breaks forth, goes forth, is revealed. It's Pari'u, that, that's the name of Pari'u. Actually, if you look at those three things, the lights, the sparks, and everything that's hidden, that also correspond, corresponds to the highest three sefirot, and very much in the same order that we're going through. The lights and the sparks is wisdom and understanding, that's the first pair. And then the third element that's being listed here, everything that's hidden, it's going up to the crown. Right? Lights and sparks suggests wisdom and understanding, because wisdom is general, like lights, and understanding is particular, like sparks. But then, we suddenly go above them to crown, and we say everything that's hidden. All, all of this comes from this Pharaoh of holiness. So the idea that all this is leading up to is that when God is telling Moses, you are now going to confront your old master, and, and you're afraid because you know, and you're right, that he is rooted in a higher sephira than you are rooted in, a higher emanation than you, although he's all evil and you are all good, but he's rooted in a higher sephira, so you need to come to me, and then we'll go together, but then you know what's going to happen? Is you're going to come into Pharaoh, Bo El Paro, the higher positive Pharaoh of holiness within you, you are now going to grow from wisdom to crown, from the second sphere to the first sphere. You're going to confront you, your own innermost essence through this confrontation. You need me, because no one can receive and connect to one's own crown without connecting to God. We need God. God give me my crown. I can't crown myself. I can't see my own head. I can't touch my own essence, the, the, the root of my own soul. So the place that you fear most, the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of fear, the, the, this place that you fear the most, it's because what's hidden there is your own highest essence, the Pharaoh of holiness within you. So come to me, because the whole idea is that you're now coming out of the realm of the intellectual, it's not understanding and it's not wisdom that you already know. Now you need to let go of that and you need to connect to a certain place within you, which is the Pharaoh of Holiness, which is a place of total freedom, of total independence, and of total, you know, also freedom from fear. You're, you don't have to fear anything because you feel that you have touched the origin of all the lights and all the sparks and everything that's hidden. It's really me. It's the, it's the God, it's the spark of God within you. That's what's in your crown. So, the, I know you're afraid, and, and there's a reason for being afraid, but if you confront that fear with me together, what lies behind the unholy Pharaoh, the unholy Pharaoh is just a shell. If you break away the shell, you discover the first commandment, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, which is me, God, and it's also the deepest me of you, the deepest self of, of your own self, who you truly are, the highest level of your own, and it lies behind Pharaoh. The Pharaoh of holiness hides behind, under the unholy Pharaoh. It's very similar, if you had a class a few weeks ago, we spoke about uh, Jacob confronting Esau, and we said that the soul, so to speak, travels backwards in time and assumes the form of your enemies. And your enemy is your uh, higher self. That's what, that's what we also call that class, that your enemy 
is your future self, your higher self. So the same structure repeats here, that Moses' higher self and, and his own superconscious is, di is disguised by Pharaoh. And it's the thing he fears the most, but if he runs away, he, he misses out the entire opportunity of everything this, this was all about. This was all about confronting the fear, and within that fear, behind what you fear most, this enemy hides your own future higher self. The difference that we didn't have in the previous parsha is the and what's added here that wasn't in the confrontation of Jacob and Esau was that you can't do this on your own. You need to come to me. Come to me, Hashem. Come to me, God. There's reason to be afraid, and I will help you confront this fear and face this fear. So this is really the 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 takeaway from all of this. Is that um, is that within this fear lies the highest, most precious opportunity, the chance to connect with God and with our own deepest selves in a way that we reach a point within us that we are fearless. Uh, we we have, and we get to this place of fearlessness by going through, passing through, confronting, coming into what we fear the most. So this is our shiur for Parshat Bo of this year. Hi, if you enjoyed this video, please press like and subscribe to the channel. Also, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Patreon is a platform for supporting independent creators. You can find the link in the description below. Thank you very much.